Karthik just to maintain punctuality in Baba's uh, kingdom. Lovely, we lovely, started, lovely. We started at 7.30 and now of course you can take over. Uh, we just thought that we'll maintain the 7.30 schedule. Amazing. So I just start, started recording as well. So maybe we lost the first uh, um, the reading out of the message uh, as I, far as recording is concerned. Yeah. Shall I read it again? Uh, sure. <laughs> The seven realities. Yeah, please. The seven realities. Existence, love, sacrifice, renunciation, knowledge, control, and surrender. I give no importance to creed, dogma, caste, or the performance of religious ceremonies and rites but to the understanding of the following. One, the only real existence is that of the one and only God who is the self in every finite self. Two, the only real love is the love for this infinity, God, which arouses an intense longing to see, know, and become one with its truth, God. Three, the only real sacrifice is that in which in pursuance of this love, all things, body, mind, position, welfare, and even life itself are sacrificed. Four, the only real renunciation is that which abandons, even in the midst of worldly duties, all selfish thoughts and desires. Five, the only real knowledge is the knowledge that God is the inner dweller in good people and in so-called bad, in saint and in so-called sinner. This knowledge requires you to help all equally as circumstances demand without expectation of reward. When compelled to take part in a dispute, to act without the slightest trace of enmity or hatred, to try to make others happy with brotherly or sisterly feeling for each one and to harm no one in thought, word or deed, not even those who harm you. Six, the only real control is the discipline of the senses to abstain from indulgence in low desires, which alone ensures absolute purity of character. Seven, the only real surrender is that in which poise is undisturbed by any adverse circumstance and the individual amidst every kind of hardship is resigned with perfect calm to the will of God, given by Meher Baba in 1952, Avtar Meher Baba Ki Jai. Super. Thank you very much. So today happens to be the day that Baba came to Mehrabad for the first time. Wow. 4th of May, 1923. Wow. Wow. Yeah, Baba. So 1920, that last year they celebrated the, uh, the centenary of that, correct? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. correct. That, that's very nice. Uh, very very relevant and thoughtful. Thank you, Sanjay. For bringing that up, yep. Okay, so the this is uh, session number 12. We are we are reading this book over uh, tw the 12th session today. And uh, by the way, we have finished quite a bit. So we've done with 250, 240 odd uh, pages of the book and uh, we're starting session 12 now. The section is symbols of healing. Um, so Ashokji, you want to read for some time? Definitely. Jai Baba. Jai Baba. Symbols of healing. Avtar Meher Baba ki jai. Please. Yeah, Avtar Meher Baba ki jai. Symbols of healing. After the Paris visit, we began to send change of plans. And within a week or so, we were told that in October, Baba would return to India with some of the group, while others of us were instructed to return to our home in the West. 
my health had been steadily improving, but Baba said, I was not yet able to cope with the Indian climate and that I would, in fact, give up my body if I returned to India at that time, and this he did not wish. He needed me for his future work, he said. The healing process, which was an intrinsic part of the wiping out of karma, began shortly after the arrival in Khans and was initiated by two techniques ordered by Baba. One involved writing for an hour every day the words, Gene is not body, Gene is soul. After a few days of this practice, I found myself awaking in the morning with this affirmation on my lips and throughout the day, it continued to repeat itself automatically. Gradually, I became more and more aware of the soul quality in myself and in all expressions of life. This was the healing aspect of the psychic surgery which Baba had been performing for many months. It indicated the mental attitude which the disciple must acquire toward his body. The second technique might be regarded, might be regarded excuse me, as the sacramental aspect of healing, which had for its objective the making of the mortal immortal, the overcoming once and for all of body consciousness. One day, Papa brought me to a Brought me, uh, to me, brought to me a small bottle which contained pills about the size of pinheads. These, he informed, were pulverized gold, pearl, silver, and a few rare Indian herbs. He had ordered them. Especially prepared before leaving India just for the purpose of facilitating my recovery. He instructed me to take one each morning before breakfast on a small piece of butter and under no circumstances was I to omit taking them. Almost immediately my health began to improve. Though aware at that time of the part which my mental acceptance necessarily played in the healing I learned only after some years after my return to America, the symbolic pill, the symbolic meaning of the pill and butter strategy. Through the study of Jungian dream analysis in which I was engaged, I was led to delve into the mysteries of alchemy. Here in the source of material of Hermes, the great master of Greece, I discovered that the properties contained in those, those pills plus the butter of which they were to be taken, symbolize the processes which man must undergo in order to attain immortality. The pearl, of course, is the precious jewel of consciousness found by man in the innermost cavern of his soul when he turns his eyes Godward. The gold represents the positive life principle, the spiritual sun, the silver, the receptive moon element in the human soul. Together they form the psychic circuit which the individual must utilize if he would achieve God consciousness. The herbs effect in the body that gandula balance essential to the immortalizing of the vehicle of the spirit. The butter with which the miniature pills were to, to, to taken is the product of churned milk to which we find reference in the Mahabharata, Book 1, Chapter 15. The Suras and the glorious host of heaven, having ascended to the summit of this lofty mountain, sparkling with precious gems, and for ages were sitting in solemn synod, meditating the discovery of the Amrita, or water of immortality. The Devan Arayan, Being also there, spoke unto Brahma, whilst the Suras were thus consulting together and said, 
let the ocean, a pot of milk, be churned by the united labor of asuras and asuras, good angels and bad angels. And when the mighty wars have been stirred up, the Amrita should be found. Let them collect together every medicinal herb and every precious thing and then stir the ocean and they shall discover the Amrita. It was from this milk-like stream of juices produced from these trees and plants and a mixture of melted gold that the suras obtained their immortality. The waters of the ocean, now being assimilated with these juices, were converted into milk, and from that milk, a kind of butter was presently produced. I take so a very, pause. Yeah, yeah, very interesting uh, uh, episode that she's recounting here especially with the medicine, because I think, again, we have never come across anything like this. She, here, uh, she's talking about Carl Jung. Okay, Carl Jung and mm -hmm. Jungian dream analysis. And alchemy is basically the greatest thing that uh, humanity has been interested to, interested uh, about. Alchemy is basically converting uh, base metals to gold, right? Which has been the biggest fascination for uh, humankind because gold is so, uh, what should I precious. say? Precious. precious, exactly, exactly. And this uh, uh, Hermes is, of course, a very famous uh, Greece, Greek master. But what Baba did, she's able to stitch together with those uh, multiple principles, uh, alchemy for gold, pearl for, uh, uh, as, as something that's the, uh, the jewel of consciousness and of course sun and moon representing um, silver and uh, gold anyway I, I i i'm not getting into the detail of whether baba meant that but uh, interesting analogy uh, is all i would say right it, 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 is yes yes Karthik, it is interesting and in the initial paragraphs there's a mention if you can go to the beginning it's a mention that uh, he's trying to uh, bring in some sort of spiritual aspect into life of Gene and Drill. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. And and this uh, affirmation, Gene is not body, Gene is soul. So yeah. it, it applies to everybody that we have to say that we are not this body, we are the soul. Absolutely. I think that's a, that's a good takeaway. Absolutely, absolutely. Anybody yeah. else? I'll continue. Yeah, please. Uh, that the churning of the milk sea suggests the profound stirring of the waters of the unconscious will be evident to the students of symbolism and Jungian psychology. Unconscious is the capital U. There is definitely some significance in that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Again, she's talking about Carl Jung, and Carl Jung is, is a very famous uh, philosopher, psychologist, uh, who uh, has written many books and, of course, has brought out uh, uh, treatises on analysis of dreams, analysis of, of the mind, and so on. Yeah. The butter represents the individualized consciousness of God, which the churning of the waters of the unconscious precipitates. Having through force of circumstances been made deeply aware of drastic changes taking place in body and mind since returning to America, I am satisfied that Baba's spill prescription set in motion a process which is now bearing fruit. The parting from Baba was an extremely painful one. In my farewell moments with him, I was moved to thank him for all the joy and pain of my life with him, to which he replied, thank me only for the pain. Now, years later, I fully appreciate the wisdom of these words. The expression growing pain is just as applicable to the spiritual life 
as it is to this physical and without it no growth is possible for human creature i think you could highlight this i think it's pretty phenomenal the expression growing pain is just as applicable to the spiritual life as it is to physical and without it no growth is possible for human creature yeah i think it's uh, pretty significant in the process of thanks in the process of self regeneration all veils of self excuse and self pity must be torn asunder by repeated experiences of pain and humiliation where were we free of egoism and self will our spiritual growth would be as effortless and painless as the unfoldment of a rose the human however has to deal with the problem of conscious unfoldment which requires a focal point such as the ego through which impressions can be centered but being only a provisional center it must some day be relinquished in favor of the true god center when this time comes both pain and effort are necessarily involved in its elimination in the ignorance which our ego fosters we set up resistance to the activity of god in our souls when he undertakes to free us from our self centered body conscious limitations were we enlightened enough not to rebel but to accept fully the will of god as it manifests in our life then our inner reaction would bear the imprint of joy as one great soul has expressed it we should be grateful for each messenger of pain that reveals at once our weakness and our biggest self to us as i have been reliving in retrospect the days i spent with baba in india and europe i find more and more that the moments which then in my darkness embraced the kinish the keenest anguish now with many veils removed give me the purest joy i am also aware of joyful overtones which were present even in the painful moment of parting from him the deeper mysteries of divine love can only be known through the olympic of pain i intuitively felt that for those of us who were returning to our homes in the west it would be many years before we would be with him again in the flesh and that many momentous changes would in the meantime occur in our individual lives and in the world situation certainly no intuition ever proved more true in my case the dramatic sequence which began or was previewed in india continued to unfold in slow motion for a number of years so much latent darkness was there that i needed to face and assimilate no cobweb corner of consciousness was permitted to go undiscovered or unswept ungarnished silent partner the trip which malcolm and i made from cannes to paris by motor bus and then to america by the queen mary provided many soul testing curtain raisers which the master was directing from behind the scenes my husband was still under the disciplines of silence and one meal a day until he reached california so it became my job to act as the man of the party in buying the tickets making all the arrangements and generally supervising the trip this constituted no hardship until we found ourselves in circumstances where alcums excellent french would have served us well while my limited english but by but by being limited to the english language proved a distinct handicap i had been told by the agent the cans that our tickets provided for a stopover and hotel accommodation at lyons where reservations had been made for us by the company 
and that we would be deposited by the bus at the hotel. But when we arrived at Lanz at night in a remote section of the city, the courier who had evidently dined and wined well that evening indicated that we would have to pay extra for a taxi fare across the city to the hotel. We suspected that this was one of the famous tricks played by unsuspecting tourists by palm itching natives. And since we neither felt like encouraging the agent's capacity, nor in fact were financially able to do so, we insisted that he fulfilled the contract which I made with the Bureau at Cannes. These complications had already provided tremendous emotional fermentation. Malcolm, who knew French, was not permitted to speak. I, who knew only English, could speak as much as I liked, but to no purpose. Ma Malcolm had a small alphabet board which once belonged to Baba, and by means of this, he would communicate somewhat laboriously with me, but he tried it on the courier. The man burst into a torrent of what sounded like very adequate French abuse. Then Malcolm tried writing what he wanted to say. That was worse yet, for his best friend's claim that one must be psychic in order to read Malcolm's handwriting. Obviously, the agent wasn't. He seemed to regard Malcolm's silence as an unpleasant kind of practical joke and my inability to speak French as a personal affront. At length, we managed to compel the gentleman by a series of graphic gestures and ominous grants from Malcolm and imploring looks from me to see the light. But at the hotel, we encountered further difficulties. The agent declared the bus would not pick us up in the morning. We would have to taxi across the city. Since the calling for us had been part of the original arrangement at Khan's, we insisted that they fulfill their contract. By this time, the altercation between Malcolm and the man had reached its peak. Then in his excitement, the agent touched me on the shoulder. This was too much for Malcolm. His hands sought the man's collar. Silently he remained, but when the basic urge of protecting his mate was called into play, only brute force was adequately, was apparently adequate to express his pent up emotions. The caveman technique worked. The man agreed to stop by for us in the morning. Inside the hotel, however, we encountered another problem. No reservations had been made for us, he said, and no room was available. Again, the pantomime started. With much hand waving, scowling, writing, and spelling on the board in French, only in the end to find out that the woman at the desk understood English. Whatever he, he said or did must have been formidable because she consented to materialize the room without the bribe for which she too was evidently angling. The 10 days in Paris deserve a book for themselves. We were there for the purpose of buying French silks with which Malcolm would resume his business of manufacturing this and selling men's neckwear to present to his Hollywood clientele a month before Christmas, a choice assortment of ties made from Charvet, Rodier, and Bianchini silks seemed an auspicious way of re-establishing ourselves financially. Our idea proved to be a good one, though I am sure the clerks at these silk houses must have wondered how on earth a dumb man could be a salesman. Leading Malcolm around Paris with my inadequate French, asking for directions on trams, ordering in restaurants, buying in shops, while he stood silent, stood by silently squirming was a unique experience which only a perfect master could devise for the further elimination of our egos. Nor was the Hover trip on the Queen Mary without its moments of awkward fun. Malcolm was continuing to eat one meal a day at noon. At one of the meals at which I sat, a young man from across the way came over to my table. With his usual camaraderie of ship boat travel, he offered his condolences for my husband's affliction. Had he always been dumb, he asked. I assured him it was only a temporary indisposition of his vocal cords. 
so kart kartik uh, you know the significance which baba gives on silence it comes out in this uh, episodes so there is definitely a some significance in silence yeah no doubt continuing he seems to eat so seldom is that part of his treatment i was grateful to him for giving me that answer yes i ascended fasting was part of the treatment he shook his head in sympathy he seemed to think it was a serious situation and that i was very brave there were moments when i thought so too on the day of landing in new york as we filed by the passport inspector i was i went first handing him a joint passport he looked at it and asked the usual questions was i american citizen and so forth my replies satisfied him so he turned to malcolm who stood behind me to his queries malcolm merely nodded his head the officer repeated his questions again malcolm nodded the am the man became very angry i didn't hear you he snarled standing beside the official was a ship's purser who had come in contact with balkam on board informed the inspector in a stage whisper loud enough for the whole waiting line to hear he is dumb he can't speak we had an anxious moment as the officer took balkam over for less than this inaquis travelers had been incarcerated on ellis island pending medical examination i debated quickly in my mind what i should say or i ask any probing questions to tell them the reason could hardly have helped the situation what would a passport officer what would a passport official understand of a man who does not speak on orders from a spiritual master he might think it a blind for someone think subversive or it, if i had said that malcolm had contracted this strange ailment while abroad while aboard because his passport showed no indication of his dumb when he left the country the inspector might conclude he needed medical examination before entering new york but my momentary concern was quickly relieved apparently thinking malcolm was deaf as well as dumb he shouted at him the usual form questions while all down the line i could hear kind ladies and gentlemen commiserating with me poor young man how sad to have a deaf and dumb husband malcolm's father met us at the dock to say that he was shocked by his son's silent greeting is greatly to understate his reaction though a kind and gentle man his exasperation became almost explosive when i told him that malcolm was not permitted to speak until he reached california you mean to say he is going to visit me for the next week without talking my expression did little to appease his bewilderment though on the surface a simple thing the silence of malcolm's is the most astonishing complications which had the effect of making one or both of us appear ridiculous or pathetic all of which was of course risk for baba's mill baba's mill of further eliminating the ego wow so keeping silent yes it's very phenomenal kartik you're saying something no no beautiful i said uh, 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 it's just basically grinding the ego absolutely and it's no, very i experienced this uh, yeah very well written i experienced this up front because uh, the early years of uh, coming to baba i i, I did not uh, you know come to uh, mehrabad for silence day but i practiced silence uh, silence in the uh, public life right i mean not public life what i mean is out in the open and uh, it's not easy it's absolutely not easy and i think uh, I, i i i am very glad that i did it so i did not change generally i don't change my schedule uh, and go about my life uh, normally so and it's not easy it's just not easy 
um, it's uh, I would say a combination of uh, uh, grinding of the ego and also frustration, right? It needs a lot of patience. Um, you are a lot more, lot less efficient. Uh, obviously, uh, you are a subject of uh, sympathy. Yeah, it's a difficult thing, but uh, obviously, um, I think a lot of us take it very lightly. Uh, the fact that Baba asks us to uh, keep silence, and also we are, I think, I, I'm not, I'm not speaking for uh, us, but generally, there's, I've noticed a lot of people are probably due to embarrassment not doing this uh, when they are away from Mehrabad or when they are in an office and so on. I think we should, we should take it, take this more seriously, uh, and do it uh, uh, because of what we just read, right? It's, 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 it's a very good experience. It, it teaches you something. And if you're doing something, you have to do it correctly. Like Baba says, do it perfectly, right? Don't do it uh, half-heartedly. Right? Yeah, full-heartedly, yes, correct. Yes. And, yes. Uh, and there is a real significance of silence. Yeah, glad you brought out. Because, and we could start with, you know, just keeping 15 minutes or 20 minutes of silence or whatever, small, small atomic habits. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, maybe we can rotate the reading. I, I'll read for a bit. Uh, thank you so much for reading. Thank uh, you, Shantik. Jai Baba. Jai Baba. <clears throat> so by the way, we go to chapter seven on that note. Um, and the first chapter part eight. of chapter, chapter eight, sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, on tour with the master. Avtar Meher Baba Ki Jai. Just as we arrived in New York in November 1937, Baba and his party landed at Bombay. With him were the Eastern women, the Eastern men, and three of the Western women. Three others were to follow later after brief visits to their families in the West. Three weeks after their arrival, Baba, with a few of the Eastern men and two Western women, made a nine-day tour to the towns and cities of various of his devotees. The first stop was at his childhood home in Pune, where his mother played the part of the gracious hostess in showing them through the house which had sheltered Baba in his childhood and provided the earthly rendezvous for the momentous descent of Godhead into man. In sympathetic imagination, the group entered a little into the supernal joy and agonizing pain of those months in which he was compelling the human spirit to fulfill its divine destiny by balancing itself in the physical body. Beautiful words. Baba's mother is a lady of great natural charm and intense spirit. The contour of her mouth and chin indicate a determined will and her twinkling eyes still retain the fire and enthusiasm of youth. Some interesting anecdotes were told to us in India of her reactions to what she felt was an abnormal development in the life of her favorite son. Often, after Baba had gone to live with his second master, Upasani Maharaj, his mother would travel to Sakori, Maharaj's seat, to plead with him to give Baba back to her. You've taken my best boy away from me, she would demonstrate. Give him back to me. Once, Upasani called Baba and told him of his mother's pleas and gave him permission to return home with her. But Baba ran away. Another time, she visited Babajan, Baba's first master, and accused her of taking away her son. My, bob, my boy has gone to stay with Maharaj, and it's all your fault. Make him come back to me, she cried. Babajan, from the depth of her great heart, looked upon her compassionately. But Merwan is with you now. Don't you see him? Then she called, come Merwan, come. And turning to the anxious mother, asked, don't you see him? He is here. He is everywhere. Yeah, you put your hand up. Uh... Yeah, yeah. Kartik, what is the meaning of supernal? S-U-P-E-R-N-A-L. One word which came in there. 
I was oh, just yeah. like, yeah, supernal yeah. joy. The yes. maybe the you don't know that. I don't know meaning. No, I, I, I don't know. I don't know too. Let's look it up. Uh, Relating to the sky or the heavens, exceptional quality or extent, he's the supernal poet. Okay, I think so. The first one, heavens, yeah. celestial. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks for bringing that up. By the way, I don't look at that uh, hands up thing. So just watch for my pause and jump in. If you yes. would like to interrupt, yeah. Point taken. Where were we? Yeah, she's everywhere. We'll continue. On another occasion, when she visited Maharaj shortly before Baba's return home, she told Maharaj that she wanted him to tell her son that he must obey her in every respect. The master, knowing what was in her mind, smiled and replied that as long as Baba lived at home, he would obey her in all things except one. He would never marry, as that was not his destiny. The mother was greatly annoyed because that was precisely what she had in mind to achieve. Knowing, however, by this time, a little of the implacable ways of perfect masters, she had to relinquish this fond desire and soon afterward found consolation in having her son home with her again. One day, while a neighbor was calling on her, Baba's mother expressed her joy at having Baba with her again and boasted that he obeyed her every command, just as Upasni had promised. The friend, a little dubious of her claim, persuaded the mother to ask him to do various things as a sort of private demonstration. Cheerfully and promptly, Baba complied. Then the neighbor whispered, But these are such simple things. Tell him to do something more difficult, walking around the block naked, for example. His mother's eyes flashed. I wouldn't think of it, she declared. He would do it instantly without question. Thus ended the demonstration of implicit obedience. As the years passed and Baba gathered around him his group of disciples who revered him as God-man, his mother's former possessive attitude changed. Though still at times puzzled at the extraordinary destiny which life had cast for her and her son, she is now one of that devoted group of women disciples who give to the master the wholehearted allegiance due an incarnate God. And due to an incarnate God, maybe? I don't know. The next step of the travelers was Talegaon, where Baba was received with the usual enthusiastic and loving devotion of his followers. In the home of some devotees, where they put up for the night, where they were put up for the night, a complicated emotional situation had arisen between two brothers who were partners in business. No difficulty, however apparently mundane or trivial, is too unimportant for Baba's attention, if it vitally concerns the lives of his disciples. Like a loving father, he gives freely of himself, his wisdom, his love, in helping those who are still caught in the snares of illusion. He therefore proceeded immediately to unravel the tangled human threads. All night long, one of the contenders sat outside Baba's door, waiting to surrender himself to the master's judgment. At four o'clock, Baba opened his door to the repentant one who was now willing to relinquish his self-will and pride of position in his family. Later in the day, Baba departed for Bombay behind re-established harmony and peace. In Bombay, the procession of needy, hungry souls prostrated themselves at Baba's feet, giving to him the love which he himself inspired and seeking from him the touch, the look, which would fortify them to continue with the life ordeal which, as some faces revealed, seemed too great to be borne. One lovely Parsi mother brought her two-weeks-old baby 
was subject to spasms of rage so violent that it was torture for onlookers to behold it. Baba, having been informed about the case, deliberately postponed the interview, thereby generating greater expectancy on the part of the mother and preparing in the subconscious of the child greater receptivity. During the waiting period, the tiny doll-like baby apparently responding to the subtle alchemy of Baba's invisible help, became calm and finally fell asleep. A little later, Baba sent for the mother and baby. As she held, as he held the child in his arms, the little one's eyes opened and were caught by Baba's powerful focused look. Those who witnessed the silent drama relate that an unmistakable expression of smiling peace spread over the little face. The mother, too, was aware of the redemptive work which Baba's look had accomplished. On leaving the room, she carried the child high in front of her as if dedicating it to the higher life which she felt had been awakened in its consciousness. Among those whom Baba interviewed was a devotee long associated with the master. An unusually energetic and excited discussion took place between them in an Indian dialect when Baba spelled in English on his board and had one of his men read aloud for all to hear. A man who cannot control action is not a man. Little self-pampering among his men is tolerated by Baba. During the interviews, the group learned that another of, another of the Mandali was to undergo further testing through a prolonged separation from Baba. To the one so designated, Baba sent the message, I suffer every second of my life, untold agony in which you must share. This is the last phase. When you see me again, you will see me as my true universal self. Then he gave directions that this one was to go on a begging tour. He predicted that it would be very difficult for him, for he would be abused and taunted by many, but he would endure it all bravely. On the 23rd of December, they boarded the train for Navsari, where they were to visit the Desai family. While on the train, to still the speculative thoughts of some of the party, Baba spoke of selfless service. God, as God alone, is not conscious of being man, nor is man, as man alone, conscious of being God. Only the God-man is conscious of being both God and man, so the God-man is both Lord and servant of the universe. He is Lord or Master in his capacity of helping all souls forward on the pathway to reality. He is the servant in that he con continuously bears the burden of humanity. To serve him who serves all is to serve the universe. Selfless service and love are twin qualities of divinity. Only one who loves can truly serve when you serve your beloved God-man, you are serving your own self in all other selves. So, discourses that we were reading uh, two weeks back. Right. The service which the master exacts is for your own spiritual benefit, but this service expectation of reward. Serving him may constitute an ordeal which tries body, mind, and spirit. But wherein would lie the perfection of serving if it were easy and suited to one's convenience? Yet, in spite of the body's suffering and the mind's torment, the spirit of the selfless server experiences the bliss of true satisfaction. Only he, who without any question or thought of reward, serves the God-man, really serves. Any other attitude is no more than paid labor. 
think the first line here is a problem. The service which the master exacts is for your own spiritual benefit, but this service expectation is to be bereft of reward, I think, or something to that effect. The second part looks suspect. Sorry. Has. It should be has. If the master exacts is for your spiritual benefit, but this service has expectation of reward. For mm. the for the for the person. Yeah, possible. Has the expectation of reward. Serving him may constitute an ordeal which tries. Or it could be, but this service expectation should not have uh, uh, reward, uh, expectation of reward. It could be. I mean, it's okay. I mean, it's minor, but we understand what uh, is being said here. The Desai family with whom Baba's party stayed at Navsari are great landowners in the Baroda state. They have been the master's devotees for many years. So Rabji Desai was the author of about a hundred volumes on a variety of subjects, social, religious, and philosophic. One book entitled 101 Names of God was written directly under Baba's inner guidance and later received his outer confirmation. The day that the last proof was submitted to Baba for verification, an interesting phenomenon occurred. Baba was holding the book and pointing on a chart which it contained to the highest point in divine existence, God, when a brilliant light in the form of an arrow shot forth from his head and then changed into a luminous spiral, filling the room with a golden glow. This was visible to all present and infused them with a feeling of heavenly oneness. Now, at the time of Baba's visit, the Desai family was being brought face to face with the two great cosmic forces of life and death. Within a few days, one of the daughters was to be married and extensive preparations had been made for the large gathering of family and friends. Also, at any moment, although only Baba knew the hour and seemed in fact to be playing the role of the timekeeper, Sorabji Desai was to experience the great drama of physical death. The morning after their arrival, Baba, after visiting Sorabji's room, gave orders that no other visitor was to see the sick man and instructed the household to recall the invitations to their 300 guests for the wedding ceremony to be held three days hence. Only the few near relatives and friends were now to be invited. Later in the afternoon, as the group sat around Baba's low divan, listening to the strains of music from an Indian orchestra, a message came from Sorabji requesting as his last wish to pay homage to his master. A short while later, with superhuman effort, as two members of his family supported him, he stood before Baba, then shook off the protecting arms and dropped on his knees at Baba's feet. He had offered the final oblation of himself to the master whom he had long loved and served. Suddenly, Baba gave the order for him to be carried back to his bed. The next morning, the group heard that the patient had slept but little. Baba went in to see him for the last time and left with him the benediction of his own great joy and serenity. The departing soul was happy that his earth life was ending with the master's blessing and he rested contented in the knowledge that shortly he would embark upon a new phase of soul life. Shortly after, shortly afterward, Baba and his party left for Bombay and the next day journeyed on to Nagpur. While there, the telegram, which Baba had been hourly expecting, arrived from Navsari, announcing the death of Surabji Desai just 20 minutes after the wedding ceremony. Thus did the lords of life and death graciously fulfill their appointed functions. While reading the message, Baba appeared pleased and spelled out on his board, well done. 
One of the outstanding features of the Nagpur visit was Baba's interview with a mentally deranged child, a boy of seven, whom the master had, weeks before, ordered to be found and brought to him when he would arrive at Nagpur. When the boy, usually extremely shy, saw Baba, he immediately jumped up on his lap and threw his little arms around Baba's neck. Every day during their visit, Baba bathed and clothed the little chap, even as he had done with his mus. Even as he had done with his mus, the god intoxicated at Rahuri, thereby cleansing and renewing the boy's mind, even as he cleansed and clothed his body. Before leaving, Baba instructed the child's father to bring him to Mahirabad the following April when the work of redemption would be completed. Like forest fire, the news spread that the master would see anyone whose life was destitute, defective or despairing, with the result that a steady stream of sick and sorrowing, many of them little children, passed before him for blessing. Placing his holy hands upon their anguished heads, he poured upon them the spiritual balm which both heals and quickens. The next evening was devoted to open house for those who desired Baba's darshan or blessing. Police had to be called to clear a passage outside among the waiting throng. In the center of a large hall, Baba sat on a beautiful couch richly adorned with pillows, shawls, carpets, all loving offerings of his devotees. Again, Indian music throbbed inside, charging the atmosphere with its soul quickening crescendo. The next day, again, vast crowds of soul hungry human beings, 7,000 of them, waited in line for hours for the sight and touch of the master. Then came the moment of parting from his gracious hosts. He embraced them as a loving father does his children, caressed their faces, looked deep into their eyes as though imprinting upon them an invisible gift. To a few, he also gave visible gifts. He took a handkerchief from Norina's pocket and after holding it for a few moments in his hands, he passed it to one of the family. One child he held tenderly in his arms. Accompanying all these simple human gestures, there was traced upon his face the suffering which he was experiencing as he took upon himself the pain and the burdens of these eager, wistful souls. When Baba arrived at the station a little later, thousands were waiting there to bid him farewell. As the train pulled out into the enveloping darkness, the echo of the crowd's reverent cheers reached Baba's party. Shri Sadguru Meher Baba Maharaj Ki Jai. The same salutation which had rent the air at Nasik at the time of the birthday celebration. Hail to Meher Baba, the perfect master, the supreme king. Arriving early in the morning at a railway station a few hours distant from Mehrabad, they found one of Baba's men waiting for them with a car. As they drove along the dusty road, Baba suddenly declared he was hungry. So they stopped under the ample shade of a banyan tree and unpacked the lunch which the family at Nagpur had prepared for them. After being bountifully fed, Baba suggested that they all take a siesta. Not long, however, did they relax, for Baba was in a light, playful mood. As he played a game with them, a man appeared on the road, apparently very poor, carrying heavy bundles. Instantly on seeing him, Baba ordered the food unpacked and an excellent luncheon of patties, cheese, bread and fruit was presented to the man with the words dictated by Baba, Shri Sadguru Meher Baba is the giver. To which the man answered in a serious but natural manner, it is my good fortune that I should be fed by him. It seemed evident to those accustomed to the master's psychic appointments which frequently attend his journeys that this man was one of the spiritual agents whom Baba knew he would contact at that place and hour. A similar appointment was described by Ruanau Bogislaw, one of the party who journeyed with Baba to Hollywood in December 1934. 
when their train halted at Albuquerque, New Mexico for half an hour, Ruano, who was with Baba as he walked up and down the long brick platform, relates how he suddenly stopped and turned toward her as he spelled out on the palm of his hand the word Indian. Ruano, thinking he wanted to see some American Indians, looked around and spied an old squaw sitting in front of a shop whom she pointed out to him. But Baba's inner attention was elsewhere. He motioned to his four East Indian disciples, linked Ruano's arm through his, and swiftly made his way Toward the end of the long platform, where he turned abruptly to the left and continued up a street as though he knew precisely where he was going. Ruano, unaccustomed to Baba's strange ways and as yet unconditioned in that state of mind which leaves everything to the master, was wondering if they should be going so far a field hunting in the Indians. The train might leave without them, but on they walked. After a few blocks, Ruano spotted two Indians standing on the corner of the next street. She was delighted and turned to Baba as they approached the figures. He, here are your Indians, Baba. One shot in stature, who was selling bows and arrows, walked away as the party approached. Before the other, a tall, impressive figure with a red band tied around his head, Baba stopped. They looked at each other intently for a few minutes. Ruano murmured, I wonder if he speaks English. But no one paid any attention to her. The East Indian disciples stood in silence. Abruptly, Baba turned and taking Ruano's arm again, strode quickly toward the station, reaching the train just as it was about to pull out. Later, Ruano asked Baba if he had expected to see that particular Indian, to which the master nodded his head in affirmation and indicated on his board, one of my spiritual agents. I hope you have uh, come across this uh, incident. I, I, I remember uh, reading about this. This is a famous agent contact. I continue. Yeah. These incidents, so strange to the average Westerner, are taken for granted by Baba's disciples after years of repeated experiences of this sort. Many of these agents, Baba informs us, are unaware of him as the person, Meher Baba, until such an outer meeting as occurred with the Indian in America and the Indian in India. Prior to such a meeting, their contact is wholly on the inner planes where names signify functions rather than personalities. Interesting. Universal Spiritual Center. In March 1938, Baba took the entire family to Panchagani, the scene of the famous cave mentioned earlier in the story. The move served two purposes. One was to spare the Western women the unaccustomed heat of a tropical summer at Mehrabad, which, owing to its low altitude, is oppressively hot. The other, for some special inner work of the master. A large bungalow was rented just on the outskirts of Tiger Valley. Here, the women, Eastern and Western, lived. Some distance away in a smaller house, the male members of the party stayed, inasmuch as the seclusion of the Eastern women was still in effect. After allotting comfortable quarters to everybody, Baba selected for himself a small storeroom attached to the kitchen. It had a very low ceiling and no ventilation except an old creaking wooden door, and it was in a sad state of dilapidation. The men, however, quickly got busy and soon transformed it into a spotless little cell. A special room was also served for the use of the chief must, chief must Muhammad. With him, Baba continued the daily symbolic ritual of bathing, clothing, and feeding. During the visit to Panchagani, Baba made several short visits to Bangalore in Mysore and to Belagam in the state of Hyderabad. These visits were for the purpose of looking over the territories as possible sites for the International Spiritual Center, which Baba was then proposing to establish. The keen interest and cooperation of the late Maharaja of Mysore and his able Devan 
Sir Mirza Ismail, together with the central location and celebrous climate of the Mysore state were strong factors in favor of Bangalore, chief city of the province. Here, some months later, the cornerstone of the unique station institution was laid. When it is completed, Baba predicts men and women all over the world will gravitate to it. Among them will be great souls from all sections of life. In this center, which will accommodate about 1000 people, Baba proposes to have six departments. One will be the spiritual academy, which will prepare men and women to give intellectual expression to the world's need for international selflessness and harmony. The House of Advanced Souls will prepare men and women to become practical mystics who will translate their higher consciousness into terms of everyday life. Another, the abode of the saints, will prepare souls to enlighten the ignorant by quickening them, quickening in them the realization that only God is real and all else is illusion. The must department will minister to those God intoxicated souls who have become unbalanced in traversing the inner planes of consciousness. The solitary quarters for meditation will afford opportunity for those whose spiritual development can best be furthered by prolonged meditation under the guidance of the master. The resting place for the afflicted will devote its attention to the care and alleviation of suffering of all kinds. This department will train men and women for a life of selfless service. All six departments will be under the direct supervision of the master. Enrollment in the spiritual center will be determined solely by Baba and those whom he will appoint. Beginners, as well as the most advanced yogis and saints, will find their way to its doors. The chief requisite will be love of God and longing for union with him. Excerpts from his message at the time of the foundation lay read. The time for a universal awakening is imminent an important aspect of which will be this universal spiritual center founded here today. Mysore will someday realize its singular good fortune in possessing among many other progressive features the spiritual capital of the world as well. I bless you all in the greatest scheme of spiritual regeneration which the world has ever known, the foundation of which you have witnessed today. This universal spiritual center symbolizes the character of my divine mission on earth. At this time, Baba also declared that six other centers would have to be established throughout India before he would break his silence and inaugurate his public work. Four had already been established at Mehrabad, Nasik, Madras and Toka and the foundations laid for another at Mandla on the Narbada in the on the Narmada, I'm sorry, in the central provinces, in addition to the one just laid at Bangalore. Sites for the other six, bringing the total to 12, were then under consideration. Wow. Interesting. So. Yeah, it's like Jyotir Linga, 12 Jyotir Lingas. Yeah, but and, it never happened. Yeah, uh, it has never happened. And then uh, also during this continuous stay, I suppose in Panchitani, from we were, he was normally operating, was the time when Iraj met Baba. He was called from Nagpur. And then Baba, Baba made him sleep in the cave for a night and then asked him, are you ready to come over? And then he said, as you wish. And then he went back to Nagpur and then joined Baba later in 1938. Uh, if you remember, uh, if you can see the building in the Mirabad, the it, it says August 1938. Correct. Mayor retreat. Mayor retreat. And Iraj had joined, uh, I think, a month or so later. Yeah, mm. permanently to be with Baba. Okay. So that matches uh, where we are. We are right yeah. now in 1939 because 1939 December is when this happened and uh, 
the other famous correlation with the episode that we just read uh, on inauguration of the universal spiritual center is the beginning of uh, the world war in fact uh, baba said as much in fact yeah. he says that as he put the stake down the ground uh, the war will intensify in fact the war didn't intensify it started it started that time uh, I, so yeah but i suppose the planning was there but the foundation was laid only in 1949 right if i can recall no 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 the war the was 1949 The World War was 1939 to 1945. No, no, not the World War. The huh. spiritual center inauguration, where that uh, Kudali is there, which Baba used, and that is kept at the center. That was in November of 1949. No, no, no. It was it it was December of 1939. December of 1939. What happened was, as the war progressed, uh, uh, the army took the property over. Okay. So uh, that's the history of uh, uh, Bayra Mangala. So what happens is, this uh, 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 the the person that's referred here, Mirza Ismail, was mm-hmm. among the attendees, and there was a grand function. I, I'm sure you have seen photographs of mm-hmm. that, where Baba mm-hmm. uh, uh, uses that uh, spade, and then he also yeah. puts that stake into the ground. And after that, uh, uh, the work also starts. but then as the okay. war intensifies the soldiers take the property over to use as uh, quarters to stay mm. and then when it came back it was much later and so on and so forth but baba stayed yeah. there uh, long enough okay yeah there is a book that uh, uh, the center has published the trust yes, there yes. uh, it's called glory of god yes yes i have that book yeah yeah i think and by uh, i have this uh, santosh meher i think yeah okay i'm not sure i thought there was a bangalore person who was living in delhi who wrote yeah. the book i'm not sure yes 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 he is the one he is a he is a basically a telugu man mm-hmm. i there are two brothers both are uh, the one in kind of in services that is i think air force or something yeah air force or ah, army correct correct exactly exactly correct Okay. Uh, are you in a position to read for some time, uh, Sanjay ji? Yeah, with me. Sure. Strange Rama. A few weeks after their return to Mehrabad, an extraordinary dramatic performance was given at the men's ashram in the presence of in the presence of about two hundred guests. One second, I'll just remove this. Though only Baba knows the full significance of this amazing drama, we may read a little between the lines and see another evidence of his use of drama, real or imaginary, to set in motion certain forces which express themselves. universally or individually as the case may require their performance was given by the god intoxicated men under the direction of leader the disciple whose severe testing and training was earlier described raja gopichand the king who renounced his throne for the quest of god was the theme of the play when one considers that most of these men who could scarcely stand in one spot for more than a moment without doing something erratic with little or no cohesion of thought the feeling and concentration which they brought to the performances were quite astonishing for the duration of a two hour performance these men not only remembered accurately their lines and songs but they portrayed their roles with fervor and real understanding much of the credit was due of course to leaders wise direction and baba's constant supervision 
Yet the fact that a dozen or more deranged men could so miraculously adopt themselves to direction was in itself an unprecedented achievement. One deviation from the accurate rendering of their parts occurred when one of the men, apparently overcome by the underlying theme of the play, broke through his lines with a spontaneous cry of the soul to his God self. I fall at your feet. I give you my life. I die for you. Baba attached much importance to the successful performance of this play as symbolic of the ultimate successful outcome of the world drama of madness, in which mankind was about to be engulfed. It remained to be seen how long it will be before the selfishness and self-seeking of individuals and nations will be superseded, as in the play by the quest of true righteousness. Heaven of Mercy. Shortly after this performance, a hospital on the hill was opened for female patients. A woman doctor was placed in charge of the hospital, which under her served Contest Nadina Tolestoy as matron with the help of others. Eastern and Western women devotees, this hospital was more than a place of physical healing. Though the constant benedictions of Baba's love, which quickened the afflicted and inspired those who serve, this place became a heaven of mercy and refuge of, for many. The first baby was born of a poor, demented woman, woman cast off by her couple, who was picked up one day by some of Baba's men about 25 miles from Mehrabad. Baba was the first to hear the little one's cry and immediately went to see and bless it. He gave special instructions for its care and often caressed and fondled it. With all the patients, it was Baba's presence more than medicines, which revived their drooping spirits and effected that cure of the soul, which alone ensures lasting healing of the body. Nor were the patients the only recipient of grace. Those who served at hospital learned the priceless lesson of real selfless service which sees beneath the squalor of the anguished spirit pain racked and sorrow laden they were learning the wisdom of baba's words do not think that in serving others you are doing them a favor be happy that they have favored you by giving you the opportunity so, such selfless service Baba himself constantly exemplifies. It is in this characteristic of the servant supreme that the true greatness of a master should be judged. His continual outpouring of mercy the hand placed upon the head to bless and redeem, the heart ever open to share the infinite love of God. These unfailing human acts of spontaneous service are the insignia of a true Godhood, and these the Master Baba wears with simple grace and beauty. Holy Hill, upon the return of women to Mehrabad, they found that a second story had been added to one room building, which had been home for the Eastern women 
for many years. On this second floor lived about eight Western women in a dormitory, which their cubicles partitioned off by a muslin curtain, by off by muslin curtains. Quite a contrast was this to the comparative luxury of the earlier Nasik ashram. Yet one of the English women writes from India that though all the Nasik luxuries have been withdrawn, they do not they do not miss them. In fact, she believes them to have been the cause of many of the serious difficulties which arose while we were there. No doubt, in the beginning of this new regime, lack of privacy to which they had all been accustomed must have offered many emotional handicaps to be overcome. But as my correspondent says, their life on the whole was happy and serene. Two factors contributed towards this. They were living the rarefied atmosphere which had been Baba's headquarters for many years. And they had the blessing of his daily supervision and loving encouragement. One strange yet psychologically understandable department which Baba inaugurated was a zoo, a donkey, a monkey, a goose, a snake, a lamb, a minor bird, a peacock, a gazelle, a pig, a cat, and two dogs had been fed twice daily by many of the Western women and their pens or cages kept clean. At one period, Baba gave orders that the monkey, then in Norina's sole charge, must always be with her even to the extent of sleeping on her bed. Thus does Baba dramatize and make equitably real estate the psychological truths which the Western psychologists deal with intellectually. Baba, of course, knows the particular inst instinctual energies which are typified by the different animals. As he always, as he also knows well how to utilize and transmute them. Jay Baba, you see this uh, different animals uh, and uh, this collection of animals actually uh, could also refer to the biblical reference of Noah's Ark. Wow, what yeah, is that? interesting. Because you know, in the Noah's Ark, uh, they 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 have one one animal on the ship, something of that sort. Okay. So okay. There is some. Yeah, it's a, a important biblical uh, story where uh, they 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 save they save uh, one one pair of uh, every species, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well put, Karthik. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Kiki Devi, one of the English disciples who returned to India with Baba, has given an intimate picture of their early days on the hill with the master. She tells of the conflicts, the difficulties, the crisis, and shows how Baba watches over them all and leads them beyond the little self into his own universal life. Perhaps one has become angry with another. The ego is hurt and one starts to see the inside. Then Baba, who senses these things, immediately calls the offending parties and rebukes them for their lack of love. If you cannot love each other, and learn to give in one to another, and you feel resent, resentment and anger surging up within you, begin to dance or laugh or go outside for a moment 
until the mind and emotions are under control. At all costs, at all costs, these must be controlled. Brooding and remorse are two characteristics which Baba strongly discourages because they are they so completely insulate from the spiritual life current. Those who succumb to them, those who succumb to them, they act as negative conductors for all the self-centered forces of the universe. They highlight this. Jealousy is another of the binding cords of the ego, which Baba brings to the surface. Then in an unforgetful manner, reveals its ugliness, its selfishness. The guilty, guilty one is now faced with a painful problem, which he must somehow solve. Because only through self-mastery does the individual spirit evolve. Eventually, one realizes that there is but one velvet, velvet life with no division, no sense of separation. Towards this realization, the master leads his children step by step by making himself the way to which they may see and participate the oneness of all life. Our language is just next to Baba's language. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As we read discourses, it's very, very different, very unusual. Yeah, I think uh, discourses and God speaks have a different uh, style of English. Her style is very flowery yeah, yeah. and very, I mean, she brings to life the whole episode. Yeah, very I'm saying from uniqueness, uniqueness perspective. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I think the I mean, uh, God speaks and all have got the effect of Don Stevens writing. C.D. Deshmukh. More than Don, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don Stevens, yeah. Not only does attachment to things, some some scribe, some scribe, the life of man, attachment to the results of our actions impedes also his spontaneous flow. To surmount this egocentric tendency, Baba suggests that all our actions should be for the purpose of rendering service. If, for example, it should be your duty to kill a dog to save three cats, let your thought be of helping the cats. Have no attachment to the act of killing. Again, he advises, be attached neither to violence or non-violence. Fight if you must, but let your motive be only to help. Eat to serve the God life in you, not for the pleasure of eating. Only so can you be free from all desires and attached only to love. For those who are aware of the superior value of linking their consciousness with a living incarnation of God, he suggests, as Krishna did in the days of old, Think always of me, whatever you may be doing. Then gradually you will realize that it is I doing everything through you. I, the doer, not you. What concern need you then have with the results? Through one and the hundred ways, in his daily life with his beloved ones, the master leads them to a deeper understanding of divine love until finally perfect 
in service, selfless in their devotion, they become so much part of him that no thought of self remains. United in consciousness to the God-man, they arrive at their own true center. One of the greatest privileges which the disciple has in serving the master is that of sharing a little of his universal suffering. Yet, how few at this time of sharing are able to rejoice it, rejoice in it and make it a creative experience. Baba never condemns, however, this natural revulsion from praying. With a sad smile, he will turn upon one his turn upon one his compassion. You are not to blame. I throw upon you the tiniest part of my burden, but you did not understand. Jai Baba. Jai Baba. Jai Jai. Baba. I, I have a comment out here. It's um, this last paragraph that you read is very interesting where he says you are not to blame i threw upon you the tiniest part of my burden but you did not understand so i think when you look at the postulates of my wish the third fourth fourth slate where he says when uh, when you are happy think baba wants you to be happy and when you are sad baba wants you to be sad and also that any time you have any kind of pain or suffering if we are able to look at it that the Master is using your body to work through you for his inner work. Then I think this sentence makes a lot of sense. Now, also prior to that, when he was talking about the I, I am the doer. So he's talking more like the director. So if you are an actor and you are working with the best director in the movie kingdom, you don't question the director because it's a privilege to work under a great director. So we have seen in Hollywood, Bollywood and all, there are certain director-actor uh, relationships. Like, for example, you know, this guy, uh, Robert De Niro and Martin Scorsese. Or even when uh, Marlon Brando worked with uh, the guy who made The Godfather, you know. And uh, so there are certain actors, directors who have this kind of relationship. Just an analogy out here. But I think that since we all have Baba as our guru, master, guide. So he's the director and we are the actors. So we should not question anything, just like in the Hafiz sayings. So for me, the essence of this last paragraph that you read is about pain and suffering. You know, we go through physical and mental suffering. So if you are able to remember this line that this is also part of his game, that we need to take his burden, then I think it makes sense. Jai Baba. Beautiful, beautiful connection to the messages and also the fact that, you know, uh, the, I, I also love the last line, um, you know, taking his burden makes you feel uh, part of the, I mean, it, 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 it gives you an entirely different perspective to the idea of suffering. Anyway, on that note, uh, we will wrap up. And uh, we'll catch up tomorrow for um, discourses. Um, yeah. Anything else before we sign off for the day? Yeah, Jay Baba, I wanted to I wanted to share with you something I thought about. I think in our prior uh, meetings we were talking about acting and becoming because these two words are used in God speaks, especially, and even in discourses probably about the difference between the avatar and the perfect, perfect masters. Master. Yeah. So the God man, because he's already self-realized, he's coming to do his work as the missionary or the, you know, the, the messenger of God. So he becomes like one of us and he suffers. He suffers physical and mental suffering but the one thing that is different from him and ordinary human beings is that because he's already in the Satchitananda state he doesn't use the infinite power and infinite bliss but he definitely uses his infinite knowledge to be able to go through the process so that is like actually becoming 
and acting is acting like you know suppose i start crying i can have crocodile tears and make you feel that hey you know i'm emotionally upset so even in the movie kingdom like if you notice there are certain movies where the actors take on the character of the the the, the of the role meaning they go through the training they go through that like for example uh daniel day lewis you know he won two oscars you know one for abraham lincoln and the other one for my left foot so if you have not watched my left foot it was made in the late 1980s you got to watch that movie it's about a paraplegic you know kind of thing so he uh, one of his acting thing is he will take on the role and when he was uh, playing abraham lincoln toward the movie he was playing abraham lincoln similarly like even during the off shooting hours uh, similarly with jim carrey when he played andy hoffman uh, andy kaufman sorry if you guys haven't seen it you should definitely watch andy kaufman the real guy that uh, uh, jim carrey played as uh, uh, man in the moon and you notice that jim carrey when i had seen some interviews where he took on that role so much that people in the uh you know when they were shooting the movie they thought he's gone crazy like so i was wondering about what is the best analogy because i was trying to understand the difference between becoming and acting why does the <clears throat> avatar become one of us and why does the sadguru act because the sadgurus anyway have gone through that process of reincarnation and evolution you know going through the typical physical and mental suffering the only thing they are doing is they are doing their duty as we all know only 56 god realized souls are there and only the five sadgurus are actually what we call as sahaja samadhi divinity in action and they are the ones who um, who uh, directly deal with the public and they do go through physical suffering like uh, ramakrishna had uh, throat cancer and ramana maharishi had uh, cancer on his hands and so on and so forth and uh, so i was trying to find the right analogy to understand that so this is what i came up with so acting means you act like you know i feel very like for example i'll go to my boss because i want to take off and i say like you know my parents are ill you know i have to go back you know because actually i'm taking a vacation okay that's an act right whereas <laughs> when you're actually becoming that role then you're actually going through the process like suppose you're making a movie on mount everest and you're climbing that you can actually simulate it on uh, computers or you can actually the actor can actually climb mount everest and do the role of uh, hillary the first guy who climbed mount everest so this was something i thought i'll share with you jay baba i remember i asked about this as well thanks for that clarity beautiful um, um, differentiation thank you okay we'll um, wrap up we are out of time uh thanks for joining and look forward to seeing you bo- all uh, for discourses tomorrow aftar meher baba ki jai jai baba jai baba jai baba jai baba